Hey guys, welcome to topic two of chapter 13. In this topic, we're going to focus on the citric acid cycle and then wrap up our talk in chapter 13 about regulation and how the glycolysis and the citric acid cycle are regulated. So as I said, for this topic, we're gonna to talk about the citric acid cycle. This is the final stage in the catabolism of food molecules. And then we have feedback loops once again to talk about that regulation of metabolism. Here are your objectives for this topic. As always, these are what I expect you to have mastered before the test, and if you have any questions, please let me know. I know these objectives look very, very similar to the ones in the last section, but these are specific to the citric acid cycle versus the ones for glycolysis. So let's go ahead and get started. When we last left off our food molecules, they were being broken into two pyruvate molecules from glycolysis. Now these pyruvate molecules don't go straight into the citric acid cycle. Instead they have to undergo a process known as acetyl-CoA transformation. And this occurs in the mitochondria. So remember, glycolysis is occurring in the cytoplasm of the cell where the citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondria. So the pyruvate will move across the membrane of the mitochondria and then be transformed into acetyl-CoA. And this is an important process because it gets the molecule ready for the citric acid cycle, but it also produces a couple byproducts that are important for us, CO2 and NADH. Now the NADH is that high electron or high energy electron carrier that's going to carry those electrons to the, uh, the electron transport chain. And the CO2 is gonna be br uh, breathed out from our bodies as a byproduct of this process. So it's important to understand how this happens. And another aspect of this is it's not just pyruvate that will go undergo acetyl-CoA transformation. There are other food molecules and macromolecules that will undergo this process in order to enter the citric acid cycle. But once again, it depends on what the starting item is. And so as you can see here, fatty acids are listed, but it really depends on what specific fatty acid we're talking about. So now let's talk about the citric acid cycle. Now remember the citric acid cycle has a couple different names. It's also known as the TCA cycle and the Krebs cycle. But it's in, but for our case, we're gonna just call it the citric acid cycle. That's what's important here is we're just gonna call it that. And what it is, is it's the last breakdown, last step in food breakdown. This means that it's the last place where we remove as many electrons as we possibly can from this food molecule and shuttle those via those high energy electron carriers to the electron transport chain. And then this is also where CO2 is produced and it's a major byproduct that's exhaled as we um, go about our daily lives. This is part of our breathing process. And so that's where it comes from. Now we're gonna go through each of these steps in the uh, citric acid cycle. And there's not any specific one step I want you to be aware of like there wasn't glycolysis. But I do want you to be familiar with these eight steps and, may, and the, main by, or the main products of the steps. So let's go ahead and get started. In step one, acetyl-CoA is gonna enter that cycle and it's gonna meet this, uh, uh, this intermediate immediately that's going to be recycled from the previous turn on the citric acid cycle. Now remember, for every glucose molecule, we do the citric acid cycle twice, one for each pyruvate. At this stage, the two carbon molecules uh, from the coenzyme A two carbon molecules form one and coenzyme A is removed. And this coenzyme A is recycled back for more acetyl-CoA transformations. So this molecule, when we're done with this first step, is citrate. Now in the next step, we're gonna do some isomerization. And the whole point of this is to prepare the molecules for us to be able to remove some of these high energy electrons. And so the, mo the molecule is gonna be shuffled around here in step two. In step three, this is where we get some of our first NADH produced. As you can see, because of the isomerization, we've shuffled the molecule around, and now the electrons are more easily prepared to come off of the molecule. We also are gonna generate some CO2 from this step. Now in step four, acetyl or CoA comes back into the stage. And now this is a process that's very similar to transformation, but what its main goal is to set us up for the oxidation process that's going to occur to allow for, um, to allow the generation of that NADH and the CO2 for the next step. In step five, we have a whole lot of stuff going on here. This is a big step. As you can see, the acetyl-CoA is still there, but the acetyl-CoA is going to now be removed from this process. This is when we generate some energy, and in this case, it's gonna be GTP. Now, we don't talk about GTP too often, but it's a very similar molecule to ATP, just instead of an adenine, it's a guanine. And so it's very important to understand that because sometimes they play different roles, but for our case, you just need to know it as energy. 
We're also going to have some um, inorganic phosphate enter and some water enter and this is all part of the process that allows for this formation of the energy and for that acetyl-CoA group to move, to move off. Now in step six we're going to start coming back on the other side of the cycle with our goal getting back to oxaloacetate. And in this case we're going to move through an oxidation step and this is actually going to pull off two electrons. So when we work on FADH2, when we have this produced, we're actually getting two high energy electrons instead of one when we talk about the NADHs. So it's important to understand that FADH2 actually carries more electrons. Now in step seven we're almost back to our original molecule and we're just going to do a rearrangement here to go from fumarate to malate. And then in step eight, the molecule undergoes its last oxidation. We get that last NADH off and we recreate um, oxaloacetate ready for the next acetyl-CoA to, um, to enter the cycle. And this is how the citric acid cycle works. So here's a review of the steps that we just talked about. For each cycle, and remember for each glucose there's two cycles, we get three NADHs and one FADH2. And these molecules are going to carry those high energy electrons to the electron transport chain. We generate one molecule of GTP and CO2 is the major byproduct of this process. And it's a, as, as, since it's called the citric acid cycle, it's a cycle. That's the big key is it is ready to act again. And remember, this is all occurring in the mitochondria. So we've talked about this a lot and we, every time you've learned this in your previous classes, we've followed it up immediately by talking about the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. This content we're actually going to talk about in the next chapter. Uh, so don't worry about that too much right now. We're just, we're going to end chapter 13 with the citric acid cycle. But be aware that that NADH and that FADH2 are going to go the electron transport chain so that they can be shuffled back. Now one important aspect of this is oxygen. You never saw oxygen really be involved in the citric acid cycle, but the citric acid cycle is dependent on oxygen being present because the NADH must be recycled to NAD plus or FAD plus in order to be re to return to the citric acid cycle. And this recycling only happens at the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain will not function without oxygen. So it's important to be aware of how oxygen is playing a role in the citric acid cycle. Now one other aspect of it is we always think about glycolysis in the citric acid cycle as breaking down food. That's how we've addressed it for this entire lecture so far. But there's a lot of places where it plays a role in biosynthesis and this all has to do with feedback loops. Based on what the body needs and different amino acids as you can see are some of the main examples here but there's some fatty acids too. Anywhere that the that this step would happen or where these steps could be stopped, the body could redirect these molecules into biosynthesis. So it's important to understand that just because we usually talk about it breaking down and harvesting of energy, if there's a big need for say alanine, the body can redirect this process and these cells will then produce alanine so that the cell has that amino acid present. Now regulation of metabolism. Regulation is a huge, huge role and you can see this from this chart here that you can barely see on the slide. And this is just an example of one of the many charts of feedback loops for metabolism. And so we're going to talk through a few things, that, uh, a few of these on the next couple slides. But remember, when we talk about metabolism, we're talking about the whole parts. And we have two parts of metabolism, anabolic systems and catabolic systems. And we always have our ABCDs, which is anabolic systems build molecules, and catabolic systems destroyed mo destroy molecules. One of these examples is in gluconeogenesis. And gluconeogenesis is the process of making glucose when there's not food readily available. And you can see how this works here in the reverse order of glycolysis. Now there's a couple limiting steps of glycolysis that we've talked about, 1, 3, and 10. These are all places that are controlling the cycle. Now gluconeogenesis in order to bypass them will have to do an alternative step. So it'll essentially step to the side, modify the molecule to get around it to create that gluconeogenesis. So it's important to understand how this works in the reverse order. And so you can see how we have steps 1, 3, and five, uh, 10 that are playing a role and this is partially because of that ATP. Um, steps, but remember back to topic one as to what's happening in those steps and that'll show you why we have these um, control steps here. And then gluc gluconeogenesis will just work in pretty much the reverse order except for at those steps to create uh, glucose from uh, energy or from pyruvate depending on what we need in this in the situation the cell is faced with. Now remember 
we talk a, we've talked a lot about sugars, we talked about energy, but what happens when there's an excess amount? Well, fat molecules are the way that we tend to store this. We don't store a whole lot of energy in glycogen. In fact, it's about 15 minutes of energy that we store in glycogen. After that, we store our fat in adipose tissues and in fat because they are more energy dense molecules. So it's important to understand how that works. And it's only once we've exhausted our glycogen stores that we start attacking these fat stores and get them used. So it's important to understand how these um, fats, how we store that extra energy that is made um, when we go through these processes. And it's important to realize that plants do it a slightly different, right? Plants don't store their uh, excess glucose in glycogen, they store it in starch. And, the, and a perfect example of this is the potato. The potato is not the goal of the plant. The potato is a way for it to store extra energy. But they also generate fats and starches and even proteins to an extent. So they can store a whole lot of nutrients in a variety of way, a variety of places and they store these in seeds and other areas. So just don't forget that plants make a variety of different macromolecules and they store them in a variety of different ways. Because plants need these for when they're growing in the dark because they can't move around, they have to be able to have much greater nutrient stores than we do as animals. And this is the end of topic two for lecture 13. In chapter 14, we're gonna go ahead and continue on with the electron transport chain and photosynthesis and talk about these topics a little bit more. Please review the objectives that I've posted for you and if you have any questions, please let me know.